it is harder to crack prejudice than an atom. Albert Einstein. So, long story short, I'm dead. And for all the good I did, eh, actually, let's just go with the not evil I was. That sounds correct. I'm now dead. And in Tartarus. I knew I should not have taken that cookie. But I was hungry, and Mom said that I could have one the day before, but this is a bit much. Silence! I also would have given more to charity, but money's been so tight, I just could not do more than spare a few bits. Stop whining, fool! I don't know, I tend to stare at mare flanks a bit too long sometimes, but it's natural. I'm a stallion, and I like mares. It can't be that terrible of a crime. Black Dragon roared with a ferocity that knocked me off my hooves, rendering me speechless yet again. The great dragon slumped back over the cage, seemed to be made of the black fog that seeped from within the cage. The two golden eyes floated about the inside of the cage, taking time to stare at me. First off, you are not dead, merely asleep. Second, you will not be able to wake up until that memory you are having is over. And last, if you do not calm down, I'll see to it that you die. So stop your whining. The dragon flicked its tail at me, but it simply passed through, filling me with a cold chill. I raised a hoof to speak, to ask a question. The eyes closed for a few seconds before glaring at me again. Speak. Bobiter, I... It might help me stay calm if you take a pony form. All this is a bit, uh, uh, a bit too much. I didn't know what was making me more nervous. The dragon, the black fog with the eyes, eh. Inside the cage, the black fog shrank and took form. In a few seconds, the black mare, Probiter, stood before me, her golden eyes still glaring. The dragon was still there form seemingly part of the cage itself. Now are you calm? The voice was now much softer. Calmer? I was still freaking out. Good. I cannot have you suddenly die until they get that pit buck safely off you. It would be so irritating for myself to be the one who killed you before then. Now I was feeling a bit confused, so I raised my hoof again, but she started talking, ignoring me. It's been said that one cannot die in a dream, but that is a lie. Without my timely intervention, that memory you have forced to have, the one that now prevents you from waking, it would have torn your sad little mind asunder. Wait, how is that possible? She gave me a coy smile. Ah, the deal was a secret for a secret, but I can let this go for free. Think of it as a piece of charity. The pit buck on your leg. No, not just that pit buck. But all the pip bucks that were made, they have a little magic trick to them. How they get it, in the little programming to a work of a pony, the EFS, the SATs, it all goes right through the pony's brains. An interesting shortcut, ingenious really, but it also leaves the mind vulnerable. Opens a door, you can say. And how can that kill me? She giggled, holding a hoof up to her mouth when she did. A pony can live with a hole in their skull. But if they shake their head around, the brain just might come out. She then pointed a hoof to her head, the grin on her face. And you, slow trot, thanks to your pip buck, you have one big magical hole in your head. And the memories of Thorn Roseland, it was going to shake that brain right out. I raised my hoof up again, and she gave me a nod. And you said I can't wake up till the memory's over, right? So, I'm fucked? First, learn a better vocabulary. Second, that depends on me. She sat down and crossed her back hooves. I can give you the protection that you need to survive. For a fair price, that is. At this point, my feeling freaked out had subsided enough for my bullshit meter to go right off. Right now, I was being given a deal with a monster mare who also happens to be locked away in Tartarus, there was no way this was going to make my agree. You know. And what? Do you want my soul? She rolled her eyes. I only want one of two things. 
When you have returned to the waking world, you will find me hidden knowledge. A secret. Your reward by agreeing to this will be that I shall provide the protection needed to survive the rest of the memory. Okay, so no live sacrifices. I hope. That's a good start. And what's the second thing you want? She giggled again. And that's another secret I will soon have. No worry about that. Her gaze and smile felt more wicked than before. It didn't take much time to think about. I didn't even know if she was lying to me, but I put two and two together. Mayor would kill me if I said no, or simply leave me to die. My options were life or death. Fine. I'll agree to it. The black and gold helmet rolled over my hooves. It looked like the kind the royal guards would have worn. That's for the soft spot on your head. Looking back up to her, she was now eating popcorn. Put it on. The popcorn part irritated me, making me start to feel a little hungry. Living the helm, I really didn't like the look of it. It looked much different from another guard helm, except for being black and gold. So, what's stopping me from telling any pony about you? Again with a giggle. And because you won't remember any of this at all, you'll be my loyal sleeper agent, forever ignorant. With that, I put the helmet on, and everything slipped away into darkness. I was back inside Thorn's memory. The mare body still felt odd, and her sprite imitating. Both the lieutenants were with her now. My guess was the stallion had teleported back with her to the ship. Thor was once again looking at the Leviathan, but she was not making the same motions as before. Begin the operation. I'll be in my room having a little fun. Thorn spoke, the two lieutenants saluting before they both left, going separate directions down the deck. Thorn herself turned on her last stealth buck and trotted inside the ship unseen. As she moved silently down the halls, it all felt different from before. The sneaking was the same, but just how it all felt to me. How it felt like I was sneaking next to her. I could feel each step, each breath she made, but none of it felt like I was doing it. It was like I was mimicking her, but she was her, and I was me. But I was also right there. My mind didn't feel distracted, with every noise and every movement feeling, failing to bark my train of thought, and my focus. It all filled me with a strange, foreboding calm. I didn't know what would happen next, but from what I've already learned about Thorn, it may involve more death, and I was calm about it. Thorn made it all the way to her room. The short few seconds she spent looking at the sign next to the door was all I needed to see her name etched into the brass. The inside of the room looked bare, other than the molded model of the Leviathan. Everything was a monochrome gray, with a few reds and blues dotting the room. In the center of the room were three large traveling cases, feeling out of place as if they were lined up. Trotting out of the first case on the left, Thorn unzipped the case and pushed it over. And out fell a unicorn mare and a navy unicorn. She had a yellow coat, a purple mane, overall pretty mare. I could only feel sorry for her. Wake up, petty officer, evening light. Thorn kicked her on the side, rewarding her with a gasp as the mare began to move. Tonight you'll be a hero. Captain, what's going on? Evening Light gasped out of panic. Why am I in your room? Why, indeed. Other than you being one of Pinky's little agents. What? How? With panic motions, Evening Light struggled to get up, but only managed to push herself backwards. Oh, Pinky is good at what she does, but also terrible at picking spies. Thorn pulled out the zebra sword she took from Life Jacket's room, slowly undoing the cloth she had wrapped around it. Actually, that's not at all true. You would have made a good spy. Too bad I have the memories of all my officers checked. She stroked the pip buck on her left leg. She calmly looked at the now terrified evening light. I could sympathize with her. Memory magic is a fantastic thing. Everything keeps every pony in order, never losing sight of why they fight. The sword was now being drawn from its scabbard. Its handle seemed to be made to be pulled out by a hoof. So, how many months are you along now? 
It must be a good three, which would mean there are six more to go. Evening Light scooted all the way back to Thorn's bed and was using it to hold herself up. What are you talking about? Oh, you must have forgot. You're pregnant! With one thrust, the sword plunged deep into Evening Light's chest as Thorn leaned in closer. Though I still don't know which one's the father. Not that it matters now. Twisting the blade with her other hoof, the blood flowed out of the mare's wound, splattering on the floor as she groaned in pain. Thorn let the sword slip from her hooves, and watched Evening Light fall to the floor, choking on blood. Thorn took a few steps black, and returned her attention to the other two cases. The room returned to silence after Evening Light gave one last gasp of air. There was no denying it for me. Thorn was a monster. Unzipping the case in the middle, he tipped it over as well. This time a zebra stallion fell out. This one also didn't move until Thorn gave him a kick. I can only guess that some magic was involved in keeping him asleep inside the case. The zebra spoke, and though I could not understand what he was saying, I didn't understand that he sounded very scared. Thorn didn't give the zebra any time to back away as she trot to him and struck him in the face with a pit buck. Blood splattered on the floor from the strike, the zebra whimpering from the pain. She rubbed down a few more strikes until the zebra stopped moving, and then lifted both of her back hooves. She brought both front hooves down on the zebra, giving his head in. The gore sprayed out everywhere, bits and pieces of brain and bone decorating the room. The blood from the zebra quickly meeting that of evening light, making a large pool on the floor. Once more, Thorn opened up the last case. This time a zebra mare fell out. Unlike the last two, she woke up from the fall and immediately righted herself. Thorn watched her as she quickly scanned the room when the zebra locked eyes with Thorn. I could t feel an intense hate in the stare. What have you done, you pony scum? She almost looked exactly like the posters back home, though covered in blood. Thorn just smiled. His word's all you've got. And here I was told that you were a fighter. <laughs> Shame. Slowly, she walked to the zebra, calm, smiling, and even I could feel her intent on killing again. In a flash, the zebra, she was on him in one swift moment, throwing blood in Thorn's face, jumping to the side and pulling the sword from Evening Light's chest. Wiping the blood from her face, Thorn jumped back, just missing a slash from the sword at her neck. A vertical slash then came down at Thorn, but she jumped into the attack, ramming the zebra with the upper part of the pit buck. Stumbling back, the zebra quickly put some distance between her and Thorn, saving her leg for a hoof strike. The zebra then went for a lunge. The sword pointed straight for Thorn's chest, only standing on her two back hooves as she did. Thorn managed to deflect the strike by knocking it to the side with a pip buck, counting the mare with a right hoof strike to the mare's chest. The zebra fell back again, but this time Thorn threw blood in her opponent's face. The zebra lost her balance. And fell to the floor. The sword slid across the room, leaving a broken line of blood on the floor from the hill to the blade. Now that was disappointing. You didn't even cut me once. Thorn's voice sounded boastful. What is it you want, pony? Why did you bring me here? If it is going to kill me, then kill me! The zebra got back onto all four hooves, and now struggled to stay upright. Thorn gave a little laugh and turned her back to the zebra walking to the sword. It's quite simple, really. I just needed you to run around a little. Get the blood to spread around with your hoof prints. I could hear hooves hitting metal from behind. Thorn's ears twitched with the sound, as she leaned forward, raising her flank, and then releasing a full-force buck. I could feel the back of her hooves connect with the zebra, and not slow down until they had been fully extended out. A loud thump hit the wall behind Thorn, and when she turned to look, Zebra Mare was flat on the floor, blood coming out of her mouth. Thorn slowly walked over to the zebra, the mare wheezing with each breast. Why? The zebra let out before Thorn brought down a hoof under her skull. The loud sound of the crack under her hoof. Walking to her door in the bedroom, Thorn stepped on an intercom pressing one of the buttons. Whitewater! You had better respond to me in the next five seconds! Her voice was loud and stressed. 
waiting three seconds on the intercom, turned on. The voice that was on was a nervous stallion's. Captain Rosalind, what's the matter? Thorne's face twisted into a wide grin. I need you to contact Admiral Life Jacket at once. I was just attacked by two zebra assassins. If it was not for Petty, Off Petty Officer Evening Light, I'd be dead. There was a four-second pause before the unicorn and the intercom turned back on. Yes, Captain. Right away, Captain. Stepping away from the intercom, Thorne looked up into the three cases and kicked them to the side of the room, splattering more blood all around. She then went up to Evening Light's body. All light had gone out of the eyes. See, now you get to be a hero. Without your death, I would not have been able to save the fleet. Taking a mostly clean sheet from the bed, she used it to wipe some of the blood away, as well as the bits and pieces of gray matter and bone. The seam didn't feel real to me. How calm she was, how easily she killed them all, and how I was no longer trying to scream to get out. It did feel horrified. This was truly horrifying, but Thorne's calm demeanor seemed to also keep me calm. A banging from the door, drawing Thorne's attention. Captain! Are you alright? Throwing the sheet over evening light, she walked to the door, the blood under her hooves making a sticky wet noise with each step. Opening the door, two navy ponies stood on the other side. Captain, we were told! The ponies froze, but though it was hard to tell if it was because of Thorne or what Thorne had done. She pushed past them. I'm going to the bridge. No time for a shower. She began walking down the hall, the sound of the door to her room closing, and the two navy ponies mumbling to themselves before following her, with only noise I could hear before the ship burst into activity. The call for all hooves on deck rang out, and soon the ship was filled with the sound of hooves on metal, which became like thunder. It didn't take long to get to command, with all traffic yielding to Thorne as she passed, the command room was silent, all staring at Thorne as soon as she arrived. Taking her seat, she looked over the room. Report! It's bad, Captain. Real bad. The stallion spoke with a nervous voice of white water. His light blue coat and a white mane and tail matched the name well. The Admiral, he's... Spit it out! Thorne snapped at white water. Dead, ma'am. Admiral Life Jacket's dead. He almost crowded back as he spoke the words. Thorne's hoof slammed down on the metal arm of the chair, sending out a shock of pain up her leg. Contact the Baltimore. Vice Admiral Driftwood is next in the chain of command. She looked around the deck. The rest of the ponies were all quiet. Get back to his position. Those zebras didn't just appear out of thin air. We must have a ship on the waters. Find it now. We will get revenge for this. Thorne growled the last sentence. All the ponies saluted and jumped right to their posts. EQNC Philadelphia. This is the EQNC Manhattan. Come in, Philadelphia. The other ships that Thorne could see from her seat were now completely lighting up, beaming searchlights on the water. I could not help but think they might actually find something, probably more of Thorne's victims. Vice Admiral Driftwood is dead. Whitewater spoke dejectedly. He then shook his head. Then contact the next chain of command, Thorne growled. The war Rear Admiral bottled message, and Commodore Long Voyage. The crew started whispering to themselves, but a quick glare from Thorne got them all back to work. This is a nightmare. Captain! A zebra fleet spotted to the south! The voice of a mare yelled out. Contact Commodore Icebreaker! He's next in the chain of command. Thorne spoke firmly and pulled a nearby microphone to her. This is Captain Thorne Roseland. All hands prepare for combat. I repeat, prepare for combat. Reports in. Icebreaker's dead. The next chain is... You, ma'am. You are now the acting admiral. Thorne gave a long sigh before she looked up at her crew. Contact the rest of the fleet. The Manhattan will take the command position of the fleet formation. The Leviathan will be our escort. Also relay this message. We will take no prisoners. An icon came up in the upper right of my vision, stating that a quest completed, burial at sea, and then everything faded into darkness.
Now, back in the darkness, and free of the memory, I searched my night-white real body out. Please tell me that's all. I really don't want to see any more death. The darkness receded once more, revealing the dragon, the cage, and Robiter. Shame! I was hoping to find out more than just a coup. There was no real deal with ancient monsters, no magical artifacts, and no necromantic ritual. She sighed. Yes, simpleton, the memory's over. You may return to the waking world. One question before I go. She gave me a bored look, but nothing else. No, I'm not going to remember the answer, or the question, or, well, any of this. But what was different? What did you do to me to make the memory feel... make me feel calmer through it? For a second, her eyes widened. Not bad. Maybe you're not just simple after all. I want you a piece of myself for the memory, allowing you to absorb it, but still be like a viewer. Where before it was forcing your mind to be the memory, and one and the same. Like a puzzle piece that does not fit. But through me, you simply became a new part. You're saying that a part of that monster is in me now? I snapped at her. She gave me a smile, tilting her head ever so slightly. Yes. Though it would be simpler to say that the memory of Thorn's actions are now a part of you. Each moment, heartbeat and breath. All that she did. It was imprinted on that pip buck. And now you. So sweet dreams. Slow trot. I was once more consumed by darkness. But this time, a warmth was as well. Everyone! Slow trot's waking up! Emerald Field's voice sounded relieved. My vision was hazy. My body a bit stiff. Okay. What happened this time? Emerald Field helped me back onto my hooves. It seems that there was a faulty program still active, and when we went to take you out, the thing went ballistic. You got knocked out. But luckily, that's all it did to you. So we just had to isolate it before trying to get rid of the program entirely. Yeah. Still don't understand what she was saying by all that. But I was alive, and still in the lab. So how long was I out? June spoke up this time. Just a few hours, practically through the whole program modification. We had Lifebeat look over you carefully, but he said you were fine. So we decided to finish all the modifications. Which means we just need to finish making a key for that thing and you're home free. Emerald had been unplugging the pit bucks as June was talking. But if you agree to help us out a little more before we send you home, then we can take your time on that. I felt a weight lifting off my right hoof. The Pip Buck 3200 floated away from in the green glow of Emerald's magic. We should all get something to eat first. Everyone's been working hard, and I want something other than another meal chip. Emerald spoke up with an upbeat tone. I don't know. I'd like to take an extra look at that Pip Buck's new code. Cloudbank spoke with a bit of a yawn. But good food sounds like a good plan. I, for one, could use some cider. Well then. Let's eat, drink, and get some rest. Then we can get back to work. June was already trotting out of the door, the rest of the techs quickly following behind. Cloudbag paused for a few moments before rushing out the door. I'm not gonna let you guys grab all the muffins this time! Emerald walked to the door. Let's get going. Or there'll be nothing but green burgers left to eat. She gave a little smile at her comment. Okay. Now I really didn't want to know what's in the green burgers, which meant I really didn't want to eat any more of them. So I quickly trotted for the others. It was not a race, but muffins did sound good. Footnote. Level up. Level 1. Tagged skills. Hoof to hoof. Sneak. Speech. Trait changed. Good natured is now sympathetic nightmares. Slow trot never had... Treatable nightmares before. Now he has have crimes he did not commit. Sleep now has a negative 25 chance to rest, and negative 5 to all skills for a short time after sleep, but gains a 5% critical chance. <laughs>